Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for December 10th, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopp Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is best practices for academic cloud service providers with Ryan Dooley. Ryan is the PI of the Agave Project and the Director of Platform Services and Solutions at Data Mines Corp. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, so click the chat icon in your Zoom browser and then you can type questions here. Um, we welcome questions during the presentation, but we will also have time at the end of the presentation for questions. And with that, I will hand over the presentation to Ryan. Let me just stop sharing here. And Ryan, you can pick up the, uh, the screen. Everyone have me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, <clears throat> super. So, okay. All right, so we should be on the first slide. Are we good? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my name is Ryan Dooley, um, I work at Data Machines Corp out, in, out of um, Ashburn, Virginia. And um, today I'm gonna be talking a bit about um, a white paper that um, they help contribute to with um, a group of outstanding folks um, spread out um, some of the uh, HPC centers and resource, resource providers um, across the, the academic computing landscape here in the, um, the US. Um, Andy Edmonds out of um, Arizona with the, the Cybers Project, um, Dave Hancock, Richard Nepler, um, Mike Lowe, Edwin Skidmore, Andrew Adams, Ryan Kisler, Mark Crench, Von Welch. Um, all these guys uh, contributed quite a bit to, um, to this project and I'm uh, the one got tapped to, to present this information today, but um, this was a, a rather large, long collaborative event by a, a group of good folks. So. Um, what we are going to talk to you about today is um, if you're a cloud service provider or you're someone that um, is providing uh, services on top of uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, what are some of the best practices that, that you can adopt, that you can um, implement within your, your project and your organization to, to better secure those, both for yourself and for the end users? Um, we, uh, we kicked around a, a lot of different ideas and um, a lot of different takes on the, the best way to, to put this together and present it. And we wanted to, to make sure that this was gonna be valuable to um, the people that were um, really going to be providing these resources to the end users, um, more so than uh, just end users on, hey, what's, what's good security within your own um, your application uh, usage and your, you know, your own um, cloud adoption. So, um, the stakeholders for this particular talk are going to be the resource providers themselves, um, the folks that are providing hardware and the, the infrastructure as a service um, to the, the, the end users, uh, the cloud service providers, um, folks that may be adding um, secondary and tertiary services on top of um, the, the raw IAS, um, the academic cyber infrastructure providers um, specifically. Um, a lot of times you we have uh, institutions that are putting up, um, that are starting their, their cloud journey right now that have um, maybe dabbled in OpenStack or um, uh, vSphere or uh, maybe they're, they're starting um, uh, Nimbus or, you know, pick your poison. But um, they're starting their, their journey along that process and they're, they're really working and targeting exclusively an academic environment. Um, that's that's going to be our primary audience here is the academic community. Um, and then also end users, just so they're aware of some of these things and um, 
uh, what's available to them and how they can better interact with the resource providers to, to implement security on their end, but also to um, to leverage what the the resource providers are doing in terms of of best practices. So I'm um, creating a, a two way relationship. Uh, the scope that we're going to talk about today um, really is going to focus just at the the infrastructure as a service level. So provisioning um, servers, uh, provisioning uh, compute, elastically scaling things of that nature. Um, there's if you if you're familiar with the the cloud stack, you'll have infrastructure as a service kind of the the lowest level there. Uh, moving up to your platform as a service, where you're taking care of a lot of the um, the the glue services. Uh, so maybe you're providing databases, maybe you're providing um, load balancers, maybe you're providing uh, DNS or um, whatnot. But you're um, you're giving them more than just the compute, and then your software as a service where you're providing pretty much the entire stack um, end to end and hey, here's just a, a URL that you can consume. So when we talk about this, we're, we're talking about infrastructure as a service. So a little bit more than you get with traditional IT and, and metal, but um, certainly well within the, the scope of, of the cloud community. Um, if you're familiar with the, the standard layer cake um, here, where you have your applications at the very top, your bare metal at the bottom, um, we're going to be hitting on uh, most of the things that are they're going to fall into this blue area. So uh, that middle tier and the um, the virtualization layer for for all the sysadmins that may be on the call. Let's see. And um, the participants I mentioned earlier, um, representatives from um, Jetstream and uh, uh, Cornell. Uh, so. Permanent so jet stream would be, let's see, IU and, and TAC. Um, uh, Cornell has um, a long, long history in, in cloud computing. So um, I think those represent the, the major NSF initiatives and investments in, in uh, cloud computing. Um, Cyverse, which also partners with Jetstream, but has provided a, um, an academic cloud computing resource for, um, for man, over a decade now. Um, yeah, Trusted CI, who obviously has been orchestrating a lot of this and um, myself and, and my team on the Agave platform. Um, we did produce a white paper that you can download this URL. I'll show that at the, the end of the talk and um, perhaps once, th once more through there, but um, feel free to copy and paste that in anywhere and, and follow along. Um, I'm gonna run through a lot of this stuff um, as it's presented in the paper. I'm not gonna read the paper to you. I'm gonna elaborate on some things, but hopefully hit the high points and, and give you an, an idea of of exactly where we we're going and the thought process behind that. Because one of the things that we're really trying to do here is, is continue the, the conversation about it with the community. Um, since we uh, first put the white paper out at the, um, for the, the latter half of, or I guess towards the, um, the end of, of uh, 20, it'd be 2017. Um, we've gotten um, a lot of good feedback from the community We've presented a couple different times and um, learned a lot about um, what people are, are thinking and how they're going about um, building out their clouds and providing these services to folks. And uh, that's something that we want to continue doing. So um, please, please do. We'll save some time for questions. Um, and, you know, this document is always open for, for commenting um, and we would, uh, we'd love your feedback. So um, let me set some ground rules in this talk, uh, kind of our terms of engagement. And so when we're talking about this stuff, we're going to um, talk about the our recommendations and the, the security best practices that we're um, we're putting out there um, as a, a shared concern between the resource providers and the end users, right? So you can't really have security um, a, a good security policy that um, is going to be useful to everyone involved if it's completely one-sided, right? Making the system completely secure is, is going to make it more or less unusable by the people that actually want to use it. And uh, giving the users absolutely everything that they want and all the flexibility they want is going to make it um, completely unsecure to administer and to, to operate. So um, that same balance, the trade-off that you have um, all the time with security and usability applies here. And we just look at it as a shared responsibility. Um, so we're also going to try to draw a clean delineation between the, the responsibilities of the cloud service provider and the user. Um, make sure that each person knows um, where their, their responsibilities lie and, and what they're supposed to be doing. And um, 
we're also going to say that the um, the cloud service provider has the responsibility to um, to really champion the communication here. Um, they're the ones that are maybe at the the most risk, and they're the ones that also have the the greatest insight. So it's going to be their responsibility to disseminate this stuff and make sure their users understand what they're supposed to do. You know what the the right way to go about doing stuff is, and and what the the best practices are. Uh, some terminology. Uh, when we talk about cloud service, we're really talking about um, this internal or this um, self-service infrastructure as a service um, model, where users can instantiate and manage their um, their VMs and their images, um, get basic you know accessibility into what's going on and what's there. But they they have the opportunity to provision stuff and stand it up. So. Um, very similar to, um, I think, what most people think about when they, they come in and, and first interact with um, with uh, cloud computing. Uh, an image is going to be a, a data file that contains the contents of a VM or a container. So when we're talking about images, we're kind of going to speak interchangeably about uh, virtual machine images and um, uh, container images. So uh, Docker, Rocket, uh, Singularity. Um, um, Pick your poison, um, LXC, you, know, you guys get the idea. Um, when we talk about your resource or your service provider, we're really using those interchangeably um, in the context of this document because I, I think a lot of these, these recommendations are gonna apply um, across both of them. But so if you, you see me bouncing back and forth between the two, just um, consider them synonyms for the next hour. Uh, let's see, running, um, running an image would be an instantiation of, of the name. So it'd be a, a container or actually a VM instance running. A um, uh, security concern is any issue that may increase the security risk to um, uh, cloud service. And then users are the people that are going to be interacting with these cloud services. So they're probably not the, the end user who's going to, to come in and interact with an application that may be running on one of these instances, but um, they are going to be the person that um, at the end of the day, they're, they're responsible for the consuming and management and maybe they have the allocation and the, you know, any billing that goes along with that. So as we talk about this, people have a lot of different reactions, right? Some people are just a little bit smug and they're like, you're not gonna pull this off. You're not gonna do anything useful here. Other people just laugh and, and some people just roll their eyes. But um, however you're coming about it, what we really want you to let you know is that we're not trying to, to pull off some Herculean feat here, right? We're not trying to do all the heavy lifting. We're trying to make some, some good idea, some good recommendations on things that, that you can apply, right? And they're gonna raise everybody's um, shipped together. So uh, we're looking for, for collaborative approaches to this stuff um, that people can generally agree upon. Um, so the recommendations. So what did we actually um, say? Well, uh, there were nine basic points that we, we promoted here and uh, I'll go through each of them in turn. Um, starting uh, probably in the, the one that everyone could agree on uh, the most, which was um, that best practices need to be disseminated, right? So whatever your local best practices are, whatever the, the best approach is that um, is right for your, for your cloud, make sure you're disseminating that. Um, ensure your images are, are trustworthy. Uh, provide method to manage your user secrets or for them to manage their own user secrets in a way that is secure and, and accessible and as, as best as possible based on standards. Uh, support privilege access within the, the images. Uh, meaning allow people to um, to gain privilege access to um, the instances that they they start up. Let's see, empower users with self-service DNS management. Um, let's see, provide methods to manage their configurations. Um, that would be kind of configuration management as a service for um, for better uh, management and, and reproducibility in what they're trying to do. Uh, give them uh, uh, a means to have service accounts. Uh, give them monitoring services, and lastly, um, offer identity and access management aware continuous integration and, and delivery services. So a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. We'll try to break it down here. And again, um, feel free to, to grab the white paper and uh, you can read through a lot of this stuff and, and elaborate um, in, in much more detail. But uh, we'll start off here with disseminating localized best practices. So. Um, we're going to talk about each of these. I'm going to talk about a use case that was driving it. Then we're going to talk about some of the um, uh, security risks that um, 
that are implied by the use case, and then we'll talk about the uh, the recommendation, the actions that we were recommending to um, to the resource providers to implement to achieve this particular um, recommendation. So starting off the, the first one here, um, disseminating localized best practices. So users um, of a cloud service often have a number of tasks that are common across their different services, uh, common across multiple uh, cloud services, but they vary in, in detail whose implementation can lead to errors with security consequences. So um, when you're doing these non-interactive tasks, it's it's fairly uh, common for you to, to have a, a preferred way that you go about doing something. That's not gonna work on every cloud provider. And when it doesn't, then it leads to inefficiencies and you start getting frustrated and you start hacking in solutions. And oftentimes those are um, just not the best way to, to go about doing something. Uh, and it puts additional load and strain on the resource providers. It puts it on the, um, um, uh, on the infrastructure that you're trying to use and it's a bad situation for everybody. So um, disseminating those is a good thing. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, uh, some of the things that, um, that it also leads to are your images not being updated, right? Uh, not having consistent patching, not having, um, um, uh, not picking up um, odd behavior, um, maybe not leveraging services that are optimized to run on particular systems, um, uh, overconsumption of resources, uh, leaving stuff running for long periods of time. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff that, um, that can be there. But uh, at the end of the day, um, a lot of it can be solved with just communication, right? So providing best practices documents and, and support services regarding the, uh, the issues that, that we just mentioned, right? Helping your users know what the best thing to be, best thing to do is. And you can do that by, um, by directly doing outreach and engagement, or you could you know, publish a lot of stuff online. Um, I think, you know, wikis, blogs, Google seem to be how folks are, are going about doing some of this right now, but also putting up sample repositories and online training, right? Um, throwing up easy buttons. Uh, if you guys have ever seen um, Heroku, um, a lot of people, that when they're running stuff on Heroku, they'll have uh, little buttons on their, um, their, uh, their source control um, readmes that you can click on and it'll launch the application in uh, in Heroku, right? So that gives you a reference implementation of uh, maybe some common software stacks and some common applications. Um, aside from that, providing um, working examples and sources, uh, pre-built automation and um, orchestration um, that's published and out there that just works and runs on, on your infrastructure that gives people a starting point, right? You can implement a lot of this best practices in there, but making people aware of, of what's out there, of, of how you recommend they do stuff goes a long way because um, there's nothing really more powerful than an example you can cut and paste. So um, on to the next point, which is ensuring image trustworthiness. Uh, if you're running in a cloud, you're, you're interacting with images, right? There's just no getting around it. So even if you're um, doing provisioning bare metal and you have some kind of orchestration on top of it, you're, you're still launching from from an image. So how those images are, are discovered and uploaded and then eventually consumed and maintained is, um, is really important right? because people are going to use this stuff and they're going to find something that's working and then they're going to um, be happy that's working and they're going to move on to other stuff. They're not going to sit there and, and reapply patches and make sure everything's up to date and that um, they're constantly giving their their software and the, the image that it's running on, all the tender love and care that it needs. So as that happens, right, as your, um, your users continue their, um, their usage of, of your resource and as their projects uh, mature, you're going to, to run into situations where you do have old images that aren't patch, right? You're going to have new people that are going to come along and say, oh, that was working for them, or they're, they're going to get a, a word, of rock, word of mouth recommendation to use this image or that one and check this out or just try this, and they're going to come in and do that, right? But how do you really know that those images were, uh, were still um, trustworthy, that were valid, that they're um, secure, that they don't have some zero-day exploit in them that's going to, to compromise your um, uh, lead to a compromise of, of the VM and possible um, problems for the resource providers. This is a, um, a serious concern. So um, is there a mechanism that we can, uh, we can recommend to, to solve that problem? 
and not really. Um, but there are some things that, that can improve the situation dramatically. And um, providing your, your own managed hosted registry is one of the, the, um, the, the no-brainers, right? So providing digital signatures along with the, the images so that you know when something has been um, vetted and, and signed off on, you know that an image is still the same image that you published you know, six months ago, 12 months ago. Um, that's important, right? It gives you some, some reliability and some, uh, some reproducibility around the, the ways that you want to use that image. Um, as a resource provider, providing vulnerability and secret scanning. Um, so a, a great story is um, I, was, I was prepping a, a demo a couple of months ago and um, we were working really late and we, we committed some code and we got really, really um, excited because, you know, we got a chance to, to sleep that night and um, wake up in the morning to find a boatload of emails um, from, uh, from Amazon because I had committed, um, I'd committed a key back into my, my GitHub repo. Um, and it wasn't threatening, right? I was dynamically generating them and they were getting, um, they were invalidated on every single run. But at, at the end of the day, I'd still had a, a key in there that Amazon recognized. And I got this notification immediately saying, hey, um, you committed a key. So we went ahead and invalidated that key. Um, you're gonna have to go get a new one. And I, you know, I was, I was a little shocked that they were doing that, but then I was actually very, very happy, right? Because they're, they're taking the additional step of making sure that even when I do, um, you know, I make a mistake like that, that it's not going to, to come back and bite me and it's not going to come back and bite them. Um, you'll find that GitHub does the same thing themselves, right? So if you have um, their keys committed or you have um, really, anytime they can pick up a, a valid certificate, um, it doesn't have to be current, but just any valid certificate, they're going to, to let you know that, hey, you, you probably shouldn't be doing this. Um, so implementing um, stuff like that is um, is very, very helpful for your end users and also for your, your own internal security. Uh, let's see, uh, providing robust access controls around this stuff so that users can come in and they don't have to make everything public, right? I wanna be able to push an image up there and um, I want that image to, to stay just something that I use, right? I don't wanna release it out into the wild because maybe it's not fit to be, or you know, maybe there's stuff in there that I would prefer not be, um, be shared. But having those in place is, is, um, is a must for this kind of thing. Um, single sign-on authentication because you, you know, you, you don't want people remembering 12 different passwords just to use, you know, a couple services inside your, uh, your cloud. Um, giving them an API to, to automate this stuff, um, web UIs for management and checking out the diffs and, and things like that. And then, of course, tagging and versioning so that you're, um, you're not forced to come up with random names and, um, you know, update your configs every time that you, you want to, um, to update your image. So um, examples of some of these um, services out there, uh, if you're running OpenStack, as uh, I know a lot of folks are, then um, their image service um, gets, you, gets you a long way to, to this. You also have uh, v VMware's um, vCenter server. They, uh, they provide a ton of these, uh, these features, uh, more of an enterprise-centric um, fashion. Uh, JFrag's Artifactory um, does a good job of hosting uh, binary data, and um, they can also do images. If you're, a lot of folks will, um, they, they will only provide a couple images for their end users, but they make it very, very easy for them to, um, to build and, and provide their own. Um, so they'll, instead of having a, a public catalog, they'll just say, um, hey, you know what, we have, uh, we are hosting our own Vagrant repository and you can take those and you can use something like Packer, build your own images, upload them, and then, you know, you know exactly what, you, what you're getting. Um, and we're just gonna give you very stripped down versions of, um, you know, of maybe, uh, you know, CentOS and a couple of versions of Ubuntu and, and that's gonna be it. Um, and that's a viable approach, but you need uh, some help to do that. So um, Artifactory can help you out with that. Um, on the container side, you Doctor's Trusted Registry uh, integrates uh, a lot of their notary stuff, um, a lot of the, the image scanning and vulnerability scanning the, the same way that um, you're seeing and uh, happening to, to source code right now they're doing over images. Um, Twistlock has been doing this for years and years and years and are amazing at it, as is Black Duck. Um, they have a, a great vulnerability scanning for, um, for known exploits in open source software. Um, and they can, uh, they'll sniff it out and let you know exactly what's wrong and then um, invalidate everything that, uh, that's related to that image for you, um, which is super, super helpful. Um, Quay gives you that stuff out of the box. Uh, Quay is a, a core OS. Uh, they're, they're hosted um, 
container registry. Uh, of course, CoreOS is now bought by Red Hat, which has been bought by IBM. So uh, they say nothing's changing. We'll see. Um, but to this day, um, Quay stands a, a, a still is a, a great place to, to host images, um, both public and private. Um, let's see, GitLab Container Registry um, has uh, container scanning built in by default. Um, so you get some uh, kind of a baseline of, of minimum um, checks that happen anytime you use their, uh, their CI CD to, um, to build your images. Um, Artifactory again has a great container registry and then Nexus does, does some of this stuff as well. So a lot of options there for you. We talk about uh, the, our next recommendation was uh, providing methods to manage user secrets, right? So if you can't throw them in your image and just leave them in there and we don't want users to do that, then um, how do they actually go about doing this stuff? Um, well, because, you know, users do need this, right? They need reliable solutions for managing their secrets. Um, it's very tough using a cloud if, if you can't, um, if you don't have a place to keep your API keys, right? And you don't want everything running off your laptop. Ideally, you'd like to, to automate some of this stuff, but that's why you're going and getting uh, spinning up VMs on the, the cloud to, to host your, your code. And you'd maybe like to have a, a Bastion server or something, maybe a, a continuous integration server that, that does a lot of this stuff for you in a, in a repeatable way. Well, that means that you're going to have to have secrets stored somewhere. So uh, when you're doing that, um, how are you going to go about doing that? How are you going to go and, and manage and provision and store and, and retrieve those? And how are you going to do that in a way that, um, that isn't completely orthogonal to the way you're doing everything else? Right. How is it going to integrate in a known fashion with software that you'd actually want to use? And um, how do you do that in a generic way so that it's not tied down to, hey, this is just for X509 certs, or this is just for passwords, or this is just for, you know, YAML, right? What's a, a very flexible um, solution? Because users have these problems and they're, they're very, very real. Um, and the, the danger of not having something like this is that in these, these cloud environments, where you want to be able to scale stuff and you want to be able to spin stuff up and it's supposed to be dynamic and you know everyone's trying to to move towards um, item potency and they're trying to get to this place where well if the server goes down then we'll just you know spin up another server that that's wonderful right but um if you're if you're relying on um uh, uh passwords to um to do everything then your passwords have to be stored somewhere Right? And if you don't have a good way to do that, then e users are going to do the easiest thing for them, which is throw it in a file somewhere and just reference it there. Right? Um, and that's just kind of the reality, right? If it's hard to do, they don't, especially in an academic environment, they don't have time to go out and, and figure out what the absolute best thing is and spin up everything that may be needed to do that, right? They're just trying to get their science done, right? They're just trying to solve a problem. So everything that gets in the way of that falls by the wayside. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a bit of pragmatism here that um, making it easy is kind of paramount, right? So give them something we recommend, giving them something that uh, will manage the stuff for them, um, something with an API that they can call out to and access um, that potentially mountable in the, the file system, either within a container or um, uh, within an instance. Um, give them support for webhooks and event notifications so that they know when stuff has changed, when stuff is being accessed, and they have an audit trail um, that they can integrate into their, their own um, logging and, and forensics. Um, Bidirectional encryption, of course. Um, optional hashing so that they can do authentication checks without having to retrieve the secret itself. Um, integrated authorization, including one-time passwords and delegation so that they can um, generate uh, uh, secrets to delegate access to, to other information they need. Um, you see this a lot when you're doing, um, uh, uh, when you have um, auto scaling on for, for some of your services, right? You want to delegate a, a credential to, um, that can be used to, to spin up a container um, or spin up another uh, server, an instance of the server, uh, but you don't want that to be, sit around forever, right? You just want that to be um, created one time and used for that, you know, single instance and then disposed of. Um, and then single sign-on, right? Because you don't want to have um, a completely different identity system to, to interact with this as you do everything else. So there are options out there, right? Um, some people do this amazingly well and have forever, right? Amazon is is known for this and they have um, a, a great service to, to handle this stuff. Um, that can be tough to deploy, you know, for a, an academic cloud provider. 
um, as a recommended solution. So, you know, Barbican, KeyWiz, uh, HashiCorp Vault is great, right? We use that at, at data machines. We use that um, uh, when I was at TAC, we use it on the Agave project. Um, it, uh, it, it checks most of these boxes. Um, but I want to stress that this is something that should be done, we recommend doing at the, um, the resource provider level, right? Not a one-off saying, hey, you guys should, you know, you guys should use Vault to do this. Um, yeah, but there are there are very insecure ways to provide secure key management, right? And uh, you don't want to put that burden on the end user. So, um, in the the interest of better security for everybody, we recommend um, managing and hosting this year yourself. Let's see, uh, next recommendation uh, about a little over halfway there, right? Support privilege access with images. Uh, sorry, within images. So the use case here is that users of cloud services um, want root, right? They want root to do whatever they want to do. And, you know, as resource providers, we're giving them this, this instance for them to do the things they need to do, and we don't want to get in their way. So, um, yeah, sure, you know, have root. Right? But, you know, the first thing that happens when you give someone root is things that you don't want to happen. Right? Because uh, most of the folks that really, really, really want root um, probably shouldn't have root. But you know, regardless, we're going to give it to them, right? So, and we're going to deal with the headaches. Um, and you know, there's good reasons we want to do that because it's it gives them a lot more flexibility. It gives them a lot of um, um, uh, discretion to to play and experiment, learn, and and figure out you know what the right way to do things is um, in their situation. But at the same time, um, it also means that we're we're opening ourselves up to um, a lot of problems and a lot of the things that we would do to, to kind of help them and encourage them to do the right thing. A lot of the experiences and lessons learned that we could put into place um, within their instances just by default, um, they can roll right back out, right? And they can ignore and they can uninstall or they can bypass. And um, for that reason, right, it just puts a lot of risk on the, the resource providers. So, um, what do we recommend? Well, you know, there's some things that you can do as a resource provider in terms of limiting the, the uh, functionality within the network, um, in terms of monitoring and, and uh, kind of smart detection of patterns and, um, um, and usage that's going on um, on the host. Looking for, um, you know, doing scanning, uh, like real-time scanning of, of logs coming out of the host and of, um, uh, of processes that may be running inside of it. Right? A lot of these things can help you identify um, poor behavior or malicious behavior. Um, I the same that you would if you were hosting these. So making sure those are in place and, and locking them down um, and letting users uh, opt in rather than opt out of, um, of greater external visibility and freedom um, goes a long way to, towards helping you secure these resources and having a better experience um, with them. Um, things that we don't recommend are um, encouraging users and kind of relying on users to do things like um, enable or, or, you know, let's be honest, not disable SE Linux, right? Um, that's just not gonna happen, right? I mean, <laughs> um, if you're having problem getting your containers to run, the first thing you do is disable SE Linux. Um, if you still have problems, read the documentation. Right, but I mean, that's just a reality when, uh, when most people start their journey here. So um, you can't really count on that. Um, disallowing the, the granting of privileged access, um, don't do that, right? The reason that they're coming to the cloud is because they, they actually want privileged access. So make sure that they have that. Um, and uh, probably the, the biggest anti-pattern is um, just saying yellow, right? Saying, ah, you know, it's, they're probably not gonna bite us that hard. We'll deal with whatever the consequences are. Let's. Let's just let them run at it and, you know, trust they're going to do the right thing. Yeah, you know, mutual responsibility, right? We talked about that up front. So make sure we, we adhere to that. Uh, Ryan, before yes. we continue, we got a question in here from Chris. Uh, have your security policy people accepted recommendations to allow privileged access within a running image when sensitive data are involved? Um, so that's a great question. We, <laughs> we actually got into a rather long um, Q and A about that at, um, at a conference earlier in the year, and uh, so the, the answer to that is um, everyone's security people are going to have to go through that. But uh, kind of your first line of defense there is your your usage agreement and your terms of service around the around your cloud. So as a resource provider, if you're uh, giving people access to these resources, there is uh, almost certainly some kind of you know 
disclaimer, release, terms of service, usage contract, something they had to, they had to view and click off on, right? So that gives you some, um, some protection against that. Not, not against things happening, but um, uh, gives you, um, uh, holds them accountable for the things that are happening. Make, lets them know, hey, you know, you you do need to think about this. Um, the other bit is that there's when we talk about providing uh, cloud resources and being a cloud resource provider, that doesn't imply that there's one cloud, right? It doesn't imply that there's one configuration and one type of access, right? Self service doesn't mean that the service is the same everywhere, right? It just means that there are um, that you're trying to enable a particular um, paradigm of access and, and computing for your end users. So in situations where, um, where I've been, where there is sensitive data involved, whether it's um, uh, PHI or whether it may be financial data or it's just um, intellectual property that doesn't need to, to ever leave the, the, the company internet, then um, all of the interfaces around uh, that are touching that data um, exist in their own kind of separate realm that have its own set of additional security on top of it, right? And so that means that you don't go and, you know, hey, I need to spin up a, a VM to to test, you know, some things. And this is my my local dev team. And there's a couple students in there and we're just going to let them play. Um, they're probably not provisioning against the same resource that's accessing, you know, all of the student data with their social security numbers or, you know, the sales history or, or records that um, have to deal with um, uh, the, the kind of the, the type one sensitive data. Does that make sense? So uh, um, it's always a conversation. It's, it's worth having. I don't think you can get around having it. Um, but just make sure you kind of think that stuff through and understand that you're trying to come up with solutions for your users here, not just um, um, uh, not just ways to to check the box because you know we said it might be good. Yep, Chris says thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so next one: uh, empower users with self-service DNS management. Um, so this is actually a, a, a this is kind of a. a Big one that I'm adamant about is is a is a user of many many clouds, and also as someone that provides resources, is that um, it's very tough to be secure if if you don't secure your communication, right? And how is communication really secured today? Um, more or less everywhere, it's through um, uh, SL and TLS, right? So if you're not running over HTTPS, and if you don't have some kind of encryption of your communication, then you know everything's in the wild and and a lot of the other things that you would do just really don't matter. So um, we would love as resource providers for our users to do this, right? We would love they have end-to-end -end encryption everywhere and between all of their instances and between all of their containers and their services and everything that speaks to anything else does so over a secure communication channel. Um, but the reality is that's really hard to do. Um, it, it's annoying to do as well, right? Because when you're when you're developing this stuff, you, you don't want to go out and get you know valid top level certs. You don't want to go out and and buy certs for all this stuff because you probably don't have any money to do that anyway. And even if you did it once in a year, you'd have to go and do it again, and you probably don't have money at that point. So, um, how do you actually do this stuff securely? Well, the the way that um, increasingly everyone's doing it is is going to Let's Encrypt and saying, hey, you know, you have you have free top level you know, SSL certs, I would like one, right? I'll, I'll take a, you know, one for this host and I'll take one for that wildcard subdomain and uh, thank you very much. And that is awesome and I recommend everyone do that. But if you're going to do that, you've got to have control over DNS, right? If you don't have um, TLD control, then you can't get these, you know, valid top level certs. So when you're running on a, an ad academic cloud, um, what are the odds that you have TLD support out of the box with your you know, instances that you're spinning up? Um, you, you probably don't, right? Which means that you've now got to, to manage DMS. As DNS is part of your automation. That means that you have a, a service um, that can provide that, uh, that DNS management for you. And that's just not a guarantee for most folks, right? If you're starting a, a new project with, with NSF, you probably said, hey, we need this new domain for the project. Okay, great. You put in a, a purchase request with your, 
your um, your local purchasing department and um, they go out and get it for you and it's still owned by the department and you know it, maybe it's run out of GoDaddy or whoever whoever has it cheapest maybe the university is is managing it themselves um, but whatever that process is chances are you don't have the keys to the kingdom and if that's true then that means that um, you now have a man in the middle every time you want to to make a change, right? That means on every instance provision, every um, every time you auto scale, every time you you know launch a new database, or you uh, you add a replica, every time you you launch a new process or spin up a cluster um, to do some work, you've got to go get you know a human intervention to get a valid certificate. So um, people try to to work around this stuff, and they come up when and they do self-signed certs and you know, that's just as secure, except it's not nearly as trusted, right? So the way you bootstrap trust is you have to distribute all those, um, the, the CA that you use to, to self-sign these things um, throughout all of the, the host that you're spinning up, which means essentially a key rotation problem, um, which is even harder. Um, for most people to pull off and especially for folks that have existing applications that have been in place that is way harder to to, um, to add into something that already exists than to add to something that you're building from scratch so um, that that old that old rule still holds here right if it's painful for users to, to bootstrap that trust with invalid certs then they're not going to do it right uh, users will avoid pain whenever possible um, and that means that you're going to see a lot of these screens, but it's also going to mean that you're going to see a whole lot of people just blindly accepting and ignoring. And that is not what you want. All right. So how can we work around that? Well, give automated DNS and, and DNS is a service to folks, right? Um, as a resource provider, when you're spinning up a, a new instance for someone, um, go ahead and, and add in a, a few DNS records, right? Um, run your own you know, downstream DNS that's going to resolve within the network that everyone's going to recognize for, you know, some of the, the, the land app and the, you know, the, the, the project level subdomains and the, maybe the user level subdomains, but throw a top level domain in there that they can reference and know they can use to get a, a valid cert for, right? That's going to allow them to, to incorporate a uh, thing like CertBot directly into their stack so that they don't even have to think about this stuff. It's just there and just works, right? They can bake that into images. They can um, add that to their container stack. Um, if you provide load balancers as a service, right? Um, not everyone does, but if you do, generate a, a valid SSL cert for them when that load balance starts up, right? I mean, just make sure that it's there and they don't even have to think about it, right? That takes a lot of the burden off of them, but it also gives you a very, very easy out because now you can say, hey, uh, whenever you start up a, an instance, you know, just uh, spin up an elastic IP, throw a load balancer at it, and you don't have to worry about SSL. Just run over that channel and you're good, right? That is massive, right? So um, make that available to, um, to people whenever possible because uh, the web is a better place when uh, the web is secure. Um, there are a few things out there. Um, this is not remotely a complete list, um, but it's some of the kind of the popular ones. We, you know, you survey 20 people and they, they only give you a couple answers um, in this space because PowerDNS is, is pretty phenomenal um, with this. Uh, there's integration directly down into to OpenStack, into um, Kubernetes, into um, uh, Docker proper, and do all the, the um, third-party tooling that you might use to do this um, along with the configuration management. Um, their DNS service components, um, OpenStack designate is there, right? So activating that and letting people know um, how to use that, but also, you know, treating it like a first class part of the stack rather than um, bolted on is um, is a huge thing. Um, and console, console is really good at this. Most people only run across console in the, the container space, but um, it is a viable solution for, for this in the general sense. And um, it's definitely worth looking at, um, great product. Um, okay, we're coming to the home stretch here. So providing uh, methods to manage user configurations. Um, this is huge, right? So um, users are going to have lots of configs. Um, stuff is going to go wrong. Uh, people are going to move on in the project and in life. Um, stuff is going to be running for long periods of time and things are going to change and they're going to forget how that happened. So being able to, um, to restore their, their applications and their images to a, a friendly state um, or even just make a little bit change, like, hey, I need to change this this password. I need to rotate these out, right? Remember, we said that was a hard problem. It's it's a hard problem because lots of folks don't have configuration management um, as kind of a fundamental piece of their their um, their application um, and their cloud usage. So, um, when that happens, when people don't have valid configuration management, um, then when they uh, 
when they start managing more than one application or, or even an application of, of reasonable size, then um, it leads to uh, divergence in how they're doing that, right? So you have this app that uses kind of this approach to doing that and you're using this app that, um, you know, has the configs baked in, you know, this way. Uh, when those things start veering apart, uh, stuff gets forgotten, right? You just don't remember how it happened. So um, in lieu of that, um, trying to uh, trying to give folks a, a way that they can um, adopt and start growing within um, your cloud resource uh, and leverage configuration management in, in an improved way that has examples and um, um, has some best practices already um, baked in is going to be um, of value. Right. So we recommend that you just provide a solution um, that is going to give people some um, bare minimum level of, of management over their applications and the configurations they use to launch those. Right. And that can be something as, as simple as saying, hey, we have a, a repository of, of playbacks or uh, playbooks or, or um, stacks or chef recipes that, that you can take to stand up your um, your lamp stack or your mean stack, or you can, um, here is something to, to run a, a J2E application, or, you know, here's a reference Kubernetes build, or you know, here's a Helm chart for X, Y, or Z, right? Giving folks some options um, in terms of, of how they go about managing that and, and seeing something that is, um, uh, that, that works and that is, is your preferred way of going about it um, is going to be huge, right? So there's, there's nothing more valuable than to a, a developer than an example you can cut and paste, right? So providing them that is going to be um, um, a win for everyone involved, right? Laziness will win the day in that situation. Um, and, you know, you also want to make these configurations, whatever solution you, um, you move forward with, you, you want to make these available to folks when they need them, right? So some folks will um, want, you know, the equivalent of pixie booting, right? So I launch a new instance and it comes up, you know, with all of these things applied, right? So uh, cloud init is great. Um, users can override cloud init, right? Um, so maybe providing a, a macro or an extension into your, your um, cloud init implementation that is going to um, let people to pull in and, and tap into that configuration right there, right? Maybe injecting a key in so they can pull it easily. All of those things are, are great options um, that, uh, that we kicked around that um, could be done. Um, and also giving people uh, things like host level identification so that they can go and, and fetch these, these configs um, securely from their host when they need to. Um, maybe mounting it in SHMAM and making it available during the loading process and then killing it afterwards. Um, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different approaches, but um, thinking through these and then making them available to users in a way that you can document and, and use is, is um, very, very important. Um, for better system um, usage and uh, adoption of best practices. Um, examples, you're going to see a bunch of familiar names up here, right? I think pretty much anyone in this call is, is going to be familiar with most of these. Um, and it, we really didn't um, have a recommendation on which one to use, right? You're going to have expertise in-house that's already going to be using some of this stuff anyway. So, you know, um, you know, move from strength to strength, right? Build on what the things you're already good at. Teach your users, you know, how to do the same. And uh, I think everyone wins there. It's the big takeaway from this point. Um, service accounts. Um, can't really overstate the importance of these, right? Uh, most, most cloud providers today are going to um, provide secure login and um, even single sign-on across a lot of the services, but um, what they're not going to provide is a way to delegate and restrict access to those um, for individual users. So do you have a concept of, of a, uh, a service account, a project account, a robot account? Do you have a way to delegate authentication um, between users? Uh, if not, then you have, a, uh, you have a warehouse security model rather than a, a hotel security model. Uh, and, you know, warehouse security model meaning, you know, you walk in the front door of a warehouse and boom, you have access to the entire warehouse, right? Everything in there is yours, right? So you just need to, 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 um, to get in the front door and you're good. Whereas a hotel, you need to get in the front door, you need a key for the elevator, you need a key for individual room, maybe the floor, you need a separate key for going up to the penthouse. Um, each elevator has its own set of keys, maybe one's for service, one's for, for customers, one's for the top floors, one's for the lower floors. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of hoops to jump through there, um, and that's actually something you want when you're building out your application stack. You want um, this privilege of uh, least access, um, of minimum responsibility, right? What you don't want is the situation that you have in in Spaceballs, where where he he's using the same password for his luggage, 
and for the airlock and for the ship and for everything else, right? Um, that's a bad thing, but really that's the situation right now. So if we can avoid that, that would be great. So some ways that we can maybe go about doing that are going to be, oops, are going to be to create this concept of service accounts, right? Uh, these do exist actually in, um, in uh, various flavors of, um, of OpenStack. These, available, these exist in, um, in Kubernetes, in your orchestration platforms. Um, if you guys are using uh, um, uh, Globus, Globus's suite of cloud services, their off has um, this concept in there. Um, Agave has had this in there for a decade now. Um, but this is absolutely critical, right? Because the last thing that you want is to be, you know, running an application, have one little piece that, you know, you weren't really paying attention to um, compromised. And now everything that you run across the entire crowd needs to be shut down because you just got owned, right? You, it's, that's a tough situation to be in, right? It would be much better if you could generate a, a service account, delegate just the credentials that you need to, just the, the scope, uh, security context you need to to that that um, that service account, and then if something happens, disable that rather than kill your entire account. Right, the death penalty is a bad thing, but that's kind of the the only option we have if if someone gets owned right now. Um, and it, you know, speaking of getting owned, right, monitoring is important. Right, we definitely recommend that um, you give users insight to what's going on because it's much better if they're the first line of defense. Um, if they so choose to be, then, um, then taking on all that responsibility yourself. But you know what? If you don't provide any monitoring, if you don't let them know what's going on and give them the tools they need to, to see that stuff, then, um, then you are the only line of defense, right? They can't actually do their job, right? So give them visibility, right? So that they're not so at risk and that they will see these breaches coming, right? In the same way that you do. Um, because just sharing this information with them can help raise their own um, competences as users and practitioners. So um, every cloud provider has, you know, some of this stuff running in, in place right now. Um, some notion of, of log capture and aggregation, um, some base monitoring probably at the, the, um, the edge of your network as well as the, the edge of your cloud, um, your firewalls, um, different things in place to, um, to guard all those. So, you know, give users access to some of that stuff. It doesn't have to be directly to those services, but create interfaces and, and services that they can track this stuff on. So that means um, providing uh, web pages, alerts, notify them of downtimes, right? Hey, we're, we're taking an outage here for a couple days, right? Do that in a way that doesn't involve email, right? Let them opt in and automate that stuff because they can do a whole lot of stuff to prevent the pain they have from unexpected downtimes if you give it to them. Right, so that stuff is really, really low hanging fruit and really easy to do. So, uh, we highly recommend doing that. Um, lots of lots of options here. You guys can check the slide deck and, and read more about those. Um, and the the last one here is is providing um, identity access management aware CIDC, CI/CD services. Uh, so users need to do these builds and they want to automate the stuff and they want to take care of configuration management and they. They, um, they would like easier ways to deal with their secrets. They don't really know how to do all this stuff, right? Um, they can deploy some of these CI CD services and they're gonna give them solutions to all of those things. And that's fantastic. But um, again, there's, there's very insecure ways to deploy these, um, these solutions for security related problems. Uh, so you, know, you can uh, deploy Jenkins and Tower and do some amazing things, but you, you can still also have all of their credentials sitting, you know, essentially um, unencrypted at rest. Right, so um, give them ways, right, and incentivize them to do it by uh, not making this stuff count against their, their their existing allocations, right? Providing builds for them where you can do the security scanning on on behalf of them, right? Give them that kind of out of the box as a as a value added service. Um, show them the right way to to manage their credentials by integrating it into some of the other recommendations that you already had. So, you know, have your your CI/CD service already able to. Uh, generate service accounts and deploy with those or um, leverage the, the single sign-on with the, the top-level identity provider, right, that already understands what infrastructure is running and what accounts have access and being able to, to orchestrate those on their behalf. Um, again, these are going to be different in every environment, but uh, providing these is going to be, um, going to be pretty, pretty important for your end users. Um, 
again, um, uh, in terms of the recommendations, uh, I think we, we just talked through those, but um, also making sure that these are multi-tenant aware, right? Users are gonna have a lot of different contexts in which they work. So tying them to a username is probably not the best thing. Um, tying them to a project allocation or a namespace that they can they can define and manage is gonna be, um, is gonna be helpful and, and fairly straightforward to, to do with an RP. Um, yep, so lots of options here. Um, you know, the, the key takeaway here is, is pick one. You know, document it, build out examples, help users, let them know it's there, and kind of funnel people towards them. Okay, so uh, that was that's my uh, that's pretty much my time. Um, the white paper is available here online. Um, I have a few minutes for questions, so um, you know, fire away. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm going to go over a few items of business uh, while we give people some time to uh, type in their questions. So I'm just going to grab the screen back real quick here. Um, first, uh, please take our survey. Uh, if you enjoyed this presentation and you want to provide feedback, uh, we definitely appreciate it. But also, uh, we accept suggestions for other topics or other speakers, or if you want to say that you're interested in presenting, let us know in the survey, uh, and we'd, we'd be happy to get back to you. And next month, let's go back here. Okay, next month, um, our next webinar is going to be on January 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is the Research Security Operations Center, also known as the Research SOC. And the presenter is going to be Von Welch and the other Research SOC uh, leadership team members. Now, this is a new uh, project, so we're going to learn all about what its goals are and what its mission is. And I'm definitely looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, I have been working on building out the schedule for the 2019 calendar, and I will be sending out um, a blog and uh, some other information uh, sharing who we have booked uh, for the 2019 calendar. So uh, don't, be, don't be shy about visiting us at trustedci.org slash webinars. And I'm gonna wait. Oh, it looks like uh, we've got another question here um, from Chris. Uh, for this to work, it seems everyone running, every, every running image would need a person with a set of sophisticated skills. Do you have recommendations for the total skill set or kind of role needed? Some groups will have this, but other groups won't know where to start. Yeah, so that's, that's a great observation. Great observation, great point. Um, so the goal here is to to lower the barrier of, of responsibility on, on the users by, um, by putting some of this stuff in place, right? So hopefully users won't have to understand the ins and outs of, of vulnerability scanning. They won't have to understand the, the ins and outs of, of how different um, registries work or you know, what, what's actually involved in, in getting mutual TLS set up with self-signed certs you know, in, a, in a microservice environment. The goal is that you can um, alleviate a lot of those concerns and responsibilities by putting this stuff in place. So, hey, you know, use this registry versus, you know, the Docker public hub, right? Um, we'll do some additional scanning for you. You know, we'll look out for things. We'll send you alerts to let you know, hey, you know, it's, it's time to update this, that, or the other thing. Um, letting people know, hey, um, instead of storing your, your passwords here, you know, instead, you know, include this in your startup script and, you know, you'll have, you'll have a config file that's in Schmim that you can access this path instead, right? A lot of this stuff doesn't have to be overly complicated. The, the learning curve behind how that's actually done, you know, at kind of a low level implementation detail, um, it shouldn't have to make its way all the way to the, the end users, right? Um, that's the goal is, is building out a lower bar for people to come in and, and participate in. So um, if you're looking for recommendations on how you actually pull this stuff out and everything that's involved, yeah, let's take that offline. Um, and I, I, I will say that I am hiring in several capacities for, uh, for anyone that, that approaches that. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you. And um, we have um, great salaries and benefits and perks and uh, a great environment for you to, to work in if, if you love that kind of thing. But um, hopefully our end users can be blissfully or in most of that if you, uh, you take a lot of these recommendations. 
Great. We, we still have some time for questions if, if people are available to ask them. Uh, Brian, are you available to stick around for a minute or so? Yep, I'm good. Okay, okay well, um, I'll just, uh, we'll just hang back here and see if we can get any more uh, questions coming through. But uh, in the meantime, I just really wanted to thank you for presenting. And uh, this video uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel within a day or so. And so if anyone found this of use and would like to share it with your colleagues, uh, I will be sending around a link to the announcements uh, mailing list, letting people know where to find the video. I don't think I see any more questions coming in. Um, so uh, with that, do you have any final thoughts or uh, advice, Ryan? Um, yeah, so I would encourage folks um, to uh, to take what you can out of this talk, you know, file it away in the back of your head. And as, as you're going through your, your journey, if you run across some of these questions or you, you find yourself kind of wondering about um, these topics, um, a lot of these recommendations came out of um, user support, right? And, and folks that were dealing with these issues over and over and like, hey, you know, this is the most annoying thing that I've got this month. So if you find yourself in that situation, um, you know, reach out, right? Keep this community going. You know, there's, there's groups to talk about um, security threats and there's groups to talk about um, application development and, and, um, and cloud adoption and container usage and all this stuff, right? Um, there needs to be a forum to, to understand how to better provide and support these clouds for, for folks. So um, please, please do reach out, right? Keep this communication open and, and you know, as frequent as is, is, um, is relevant to you and uh, you'll benefit many more people than you realize. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, apologies, I was also typing in the chat. I, I just reposted the white paper uh, link there for those of you who are following along. And uh, I can put the white paper link in the uh, email notification when I send out the video. Great, okay, so uh, with that, I just wanna thank you again, Ryan, for presenting and I will uh, stop the recording.